So you already know me, I talked to you in the beginning, I'm Kate Ackerman, and basically I'm going to talk about the question a lot of women have about performance. Does my period affect me? What's the point of my period? I really wish I didn't have to have a period. All these things, and I'm so proud of all the guys who are in the room who are going to bear with us for an hour to talk about menstrual cycles. You guys are rock stars. Um, this is a long, complicated talk. I spent actually weeks working on this talk, which I don't normally do. I give talks all the time. But this is a complicated topic. And the take-home point, so if you guys feel tired, I won't be offended if you fall asleep a little. The take-home point is there's a lot of stuff we still don't know. And the research is murky. So what I can do is explain the couple things that we do know, what some of the hypotheses are, and what's wrong with the studies that are there, and how we can start making them better. So we'll just basically catch up on what data is available. So we start with childhood. You know, we go back to hormones in the beginning. You know, when do girls and boys really become different? When does it really start affecting their performance? Childhood's a fun time. It's a pleasant time before hormonal differences really kick in. And this is when you see the little boys and the girls playing soccer all happily together. And then things change, and we go through this adolescence. So there's this height velocity that happens in boys and girls, and it happens um, at different times, but you can see um, if you can understand the slide, that on the left, we're really looking at such fast velocity they had to use a different axis. So very, very early, starting from in utero, and then the early few months of life, kids are growing super fast. Any of you have, who have little kids, you're amazed. You go to a doctor's appointment every couple months, and they just keep getting longer and bigger fa very fast. And then it slows down for a little while, and there's this kind of little lag that happens around 6 to 10. There's a little bump, but there's not much. And then there's this bump again during puberty. And then it all slows down again. The only point of this graph really is to let you know that we have these changes in height velocity and they're going to affect our um, growth and if you, if you've, as you've heard in all of the talks, when you have changes in growth, you might have bones growing way faster than ligaments or tendons and you might be at an increased risk of injury. There might be um, a lack of flexibility for a little while during these growth spurts. And this growing pains that kids talk about or that the parents talk about sometimes are fairly real because they're getting aches and pains where some of the bones are trying to elongate. And it's also important to realize that the girls and the boys are at different times. So the boys are happening a little bit later than the girls are. And when they do hit it, their growth velocity is even faster than the girls. So in terms of fat mass, in early childhood, if we think of it in terms of absolute kilograms, it's compar comparable by sex in children ages 3 to 5. So kilogram to kilogram, boy to girl, they have about the same number of kilograms of fat. In mid-childhood, girls accumulate fat mass more rapidly than boys. So girls are starting to accumulate more fat, and that's just normal childhood. And then during adolescence, girl, girls gain fat mass at an average annual rate of about a little over one kilogram per year. And then boys maintain a relatively fixed amount of absolute fat mass. So they're kind of just holding on to the amount of fat mass that they have, but their bodies keep growing. So their percent body fat is decreasing. So they're holding on to what they have, but they're elongating, and they're getting more lean muscle. And girls are still gaining it. During puberty, boys acquire fat-free mass at a greater rate. We touched upon this this morning because we talked about how boys get more testosterone, they're pumping iron, the testosterone's helping them build muscle. So they really acquire fat-free mass at a greater rate for a longer period of, period of time than girls do. In one study, they found that stable adult values of fat-free mass were achieved around the age of 15 or 16 for girls and about two to three years later for boys. So what about bone mineral density? In infancy and early childhood, the percent of mineral, which is mostly bone salts, in fat-free mass is relatively stable. So fat-free mass is basically, if we have our whole weight, fat-free mass is the water, it's the skeletal muscle, it's the bone. So now we're talking about the portion of that that's actually bone density. In mid-childhood and early puberty, the mineral percent rises disproportionately. So the bone density and the bone mass really grows a lot during that period. And you saw that chart. We're going to flash that a lot tomorrow when we talk about female athlete triad. Dr. Quinn talked about it already. That increase of peak bone density that happens during adolescence is huge. Um, during puberty, when they looked at a longitudinal study of girls, they found peak bone mineral content velocity took place around menarche, so right when they're getting their period, and about 9 to 12 months after their peak height velocity. So again, we really want to make sure that people have hormones that are doing what they need to do around that time to increase their, their bone mass appropriately. In another study, bone width increased before mineral content. So we see that the bones expand, and then they have to fill in. So during that time, bones are getting wider, and that happens, so there's almost a vulnerable time when people are at a higher risk to fracture because their bones haven't filled in all the way. 
Um, the changes occur earlier in girls than in boys, with most of the changes again occurring around 12 months before or after the period. So onset of puberty, how does this all work? How does the magic happen? Well, basically, there are three different hormonal events that occur. First, up in the brain, we have the hypothalamus, and then below that is the pituitary. So right, if you went right through your nose, you would get to your pituitary gland. In fact, when they have to do pituitary surgery, they actually go through people's noses to get to the pituitary. So the hypothalamus is above that, and it produces gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GNRH. And that then um, stimulates the pituitary and the anterior portion of the pituitary to make FSH and LH. Those then stimulate the ovaries and the testes in boys to secrete androgens and estrogens. And I underline this because obviously we're talking about women, they have the ovaries, but they also have both androgens and estrogens coming from the ovaries. And men also have androgens and estrogens. So when we talk about these differences between males and females, it's really the amount and the ratio, but it's important to keep in mind that both men and women have androgens and estrogens. So when all that happens, the secondary sex characteristics develop, so that's things like pubic hair, axillary hair, smelly armpits, all that fun stuff of puberty, breast development, gamete production, so women start to ovulate. And then there's this sudden increase, increase in growth rate leading to the closure of the epiphyses, so we talk about closing of the growth plates, um, and all of this is happening during those few years. So it's also important as coaches, as parents, to understand that yes, there are average ages when all this happens, but really, every kid is different. And you may have a 12-year-old, like on this left side, who's pre-pubertal, and she's kind of a late mature, and then you have a mid-puberty person who's 12, and then you have this more advanced girl who's 12. Same thing happens with boys. So the average age of menarche, or the average age of a woman's first getting her period, is around 12 and a half. But we know that that's a range. So the number that we all think of as clinicians is really, we want to make sure that girls are getting checked out by the time they're 15 and a half. If they've already developed some breasts, and they've already had some pubic hair and axillary hair, if they still don't get a period, they should see a doctor at 15 and a half to make sure that we're not missing something or to make sure that they don't have female athlete triad or some of those other things in the differential Dr. Quinn talked about. So pituitary adenoma, PCOS, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, all sorts of things that an endocrinologist or a sports doctor who's used to seeing these kind of patients can help rule out. So what are some of the perils of puberty? Nobody likes going through puberty, um, but there's some things that, that really happen that are kind of a, 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 a poor aspect of it that we just have to deal with. So for a while, girls can become um, anemic, and when they did the NHANES uh, survey, they found that American girls around 12 to 15, 9% of them had iron deficiency, and there was a 2% incidence of anemia. So if you think about it, they're starting to menstruate. Some of them are starting to go on diets and are getting into some habits of staying away from red meat. So that combination of heavy periods and not getting iron in their diet, it's not surprising that some of them become anemic. Um, acne with the changes in hormones that are going on, the fluctuations are abrupt, and so so um, basically the skin is more sensitive and there's more testosterone floating around in the skin cells and so the acne increases. Depression, so this is pretty interesting. During childhood, there aren't any gender differences in depression rates. But during adolescence, the prevalence of depression is two times greater in girls versus boys. And I think this is a great question. You know, is it environment, is it nature, is it nurture? As puberty progresses, boys develop a more positive self-image and mood, but girls experience a diminished perceived physical appearance. When I read that, that just made me sad. I thought, you know, this is a natural thing we want everyone to go through. You have to get through puberty to become an adult. We all want to become an adult. It beats the alternative. And here, girls feel horrible about it, and guys feel like studs. Girls are thinking, I was a great athlete, but now my boobs are in the way. I was able to work out all the time, and now my hips are getting wider, and my knees hurt, and now I'm, I've got my period. This stinks. And do I look fat? And guys are like, check it out. You know, I hit the gym and I'm really getting the muscle gains I want. So it's really interesting that this whole body image thing is playing into it. There may be a hormonal reason for it as well, but I think a lot of it is societal and what our expectations are. And it's worse in Caucasians versus African American girls. And I think that says something about societal in terms of body image and how we're perceiving ourselves. So Caucasian girls also exhibit diminished self-worth worth, worth as they pass from early to mid-adolescence. Musculoskeletal injury. So we talked about this change in the growth rate and peak height velocity. So the greatest risk of damage is to the epiphyses, so at the growth plates, when kids are super active and the, and the growth plates are still open. Um, but as we have this variable growth rate of body parts, there's an increase in muscle mass, a limited range of motion because everything is tight, because we're still trying to get our flexibility back as our bones elongate. And so there's an increased risk of strains and sprains. 
And then there's also um, part of puberty is dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So that term really means periods are irregular. It's not often that a girl gets her first period and then it's clockwork from the beginning. We expect it to be irregular for the first year and a half. It's fine if someone brings in their daughter to see me because they're worried that their cycles are abnormal in the first year and a half, but it makes my job really easy. I basically say, Let's suck it up for a year and a half and see how it goes, because it might regulate itself. So in that first year and a half, the body's still getting used to it, and people can have heavy bleeding, they can have cramping, um, they can have all sorts of things that aren't normal cycles quite yet. So let's talk about the menstrual cycle. To understand the rest of this talk, if you forget where we are in the cycle, raise your hand, because if you don't think about this all the time, you don't remember these terms, so interrupt me any time. But basically, day one of menses, the first day a girl has any bleeding is, is zero. That is ground zero. And then they have the loss of their endometrial lining, all that blood's blowing out, that's menses. After that is the end of the follicular phase, and the follicular phase is really estradiol increasing a lot. So we see this nice increase in estradiol, and then we have that LH surge. So the hormonal system's crazy. Estradiol is basically telling LH something, and then LH is feeding right back to the ovaries and telling estradiol and progesterone something. So it's this constant feedback. So that's why we talk about that, that estradiol increase and that LH surge. So the thing to really remember is the follicular phase is first the period and then building up estradiol. Then a woman ovulates after that LH surge, and then we call the second phase the luteal phase. So estradiol has been building up the endometrial lining, getting it ready for ovulation and for an egg to implant when it hits a sperm and they become an embryo. So it's getting all ready. This ovulation happens. When that ovulation happens, the corpus luteum basically makes progesterone. So now the second half of the phase is progesterone. Progesterone maintains the endometrial lining. So you had estradiol building up the lining, progesterone maintaining it. And then if a girl doesn't get pregnant, um, that corpus luteum just involutes, it just dies off, and so now there's a sudden drop in progesterone, and that's then causing a withdrawal bleed. It no longer, your body no longer has progesterone to maintain that lining, and so then there's this sloughing. And that's just normal life. That's what should happen every month, and so in general, there should be this menses, there should be a buildup of the lining, then the luteal phase happens, and there's this progesterone that's maintaining the lining, there's no pregnancy, and then there's a, a sloughing of the, the lining. Does everyone understand that? Okay, that's really important to understand how all the rest of this works. So what is normal menstruation? Again, people come in, they're concerned about their kid, they're concerned about themselves, and they say, oh, my period's every 32 days. What the heck? And I'm like, that's great. Who cares? 28 plus or minus 7. We're going to take a coffee break. Greg's going to bring me my coffee right to the stadium, or podium, so I don't fall asleep. Um, <laughs> Oligomenorrhea. So oligomenorrhea basically means a menstrual cycle longer than 35 days. What are you doing? You're leaving over there? That's just, that's just a tease. <laughs> so then, um, then there's luteal suppression. So luteal suppression basically means there's a menstrual cycle with a luteal phase that's shorter than 11 days. And it's usually, thank you, with a low concentration of progesterone. So a lot of times people might have a little shortened menstrual cycle, and that could be because they have this luteal suppression or a little bit of a luteal defect. And ovulation. So this is tricky. This is maybe the patient that comes to see me who's 35 years old. She's a recreational runner. She's trying to get pregnant. She says she's really not doing that many numbers of uh, hours of activity, and she just can't get pregnant, and she's getting a period. So what the heck? Well, it turns out you can get a normal menstrual period, you think, but you're not ovulating. So that's not necessarily detectable just by your going around your business and not getting morning labs every day or not doing ovulation tests. And then the last thing is amenorrhea. That's not getting a cycle for, th for 90 days or more. So basically three months of no cycle. So eumenorrhea, remember, 28 days plus or minus seven, A-OK. -okay. So then there's two types to keep in mind. So when we're talking about adolescence, we have to think about primary amenorrhea and then secondary amenorrhea. Primary amenorrhea means, again, that girl that's 15 and a half and she hasn't gotten her period yet. I wrote 15 here because some people say 15, some people say 15 and a half. The numbers change, depends if you ask ACOG or you know, Endocrine Society or who you talk to. So we go with 15 and a half. Um, secondary means a girl got her cycle at a normal time, but then she lost it. So the workup is going to be different. If I have a girl who's never gotten her period, it's a much bigger um, lab evaluation to look for all sorts of other reasons, genetic problems and things that they might have that would keep them from getting their period. If I have a girl who got her period and then she's a, tr a three-sport athlete and her BMI is really low and she doesn't eat that much, it's not rocket science. Sometimes it just might be female athlete triad. So what is the triad? How many here know what the triad is? And you got asked this morning, so you better know by now. Excellent. 
So this was a term that was coined in the mid-90s, and basically it was a group at the ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, who started noting, noticing this combination that was going on. We have these athletes, they don't eat that much, they don't seem to get their period, and their bones break. Hey, let's come up with a triad. So back then they really thought of it as disordered eating, and it was people who really had anorexia, bulimia, um, a dsm 4 diagnosis that sounded like an eating disorder, but they couldn't put their finger on it. And then they updated their position stand about this about 2007, and they said, you know what, it's really um, broader than that, and it's not that they have to have anorexia or bulimia. They may not be getting enough calories in, like Dr. Quinn said. It may be an inadvertent. Somebody thinks that they get by on 2,000 calories that swell, but actually they're burning 3,500, so then they're not getting enough energy in. So it's more this concept of energy availability. And then the amenorrhea, so it's not just that they don't get their period. It could be some other functional abnormality, like an ovulation that they don't know about. And then it doesn't have to be full-blown, old lady crinkled up osteoporosis. It could be lower bone density than we expect for their age, a more frequent risk of stress fracture. So other types that are less severe um, of poor bone health. And like Bridget showed you this morning, we think of it as a continuum. We want all our athletes to be up here. Athletes in general, should, if they're weight-bearing athletes, they're doing all this pounding on their bones. That's good for bone turnover and bone building. They should have higher bone density than their non-athletic counterparts. If you're a swimmer, you're kind of out of luck. Cross-train, because we need that weight-bearing. So swimmers should be doing some running. They should be doing some weight-bearing. All athletes should be doing some sort of cross-train for tons of reasons. And so certainly for non-weight-bearing sports like cycling and swimming, that weight-bearing needs to be brought into play. So how do these things all interrelate? Uh, you know, it's, it's really this negative energy balance that disrupts that hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. Um, but it's important to realize that low energy availability al alters lots of hormones. So it was traditionally done in the past that you would just put a girl on the pill, you gave her some estrogen, life was good, all the track coaches were happy, the primary care doctor was happy, the girl was psyched because she knew when she was getting her period, it was clockwork, and everyone thought everything was fine. But it's not just about estrogen, and it's important to realize that a lot of different hormonal fluctuations happen with the menstrual cycle, and a lot of different hormones affect bone density. So here's just a few citations of some of the research everybody's done looking at all these different hormones, and we see that when there's low energy availability, it actually increase, increases things you've probably never even heard of. Fasting PYY, ghrelin, cortisol, growth hormone. It decreases FSH, LH, estradiol, insulin, glucose, IGF-1, T3, leptin, and all of those things have a relationship with bone and other performance things involved in athletics. So, again, one of my favorite slides I show to people all the time, like, like Bridget said, 90% of a woman's peak bone mass is accrued by age 18. We don't want to miss this time during adolescence when people should be getting, building up as much bone as they possibly can because, you know, whatever you do, eventually a woman's going to go through menopause and there's going to be this abrupt drop in hormones, particularly estradiol and estrogen, and then there's going to be some bone loss. So if you want to fill and get as high as you possibly can before you have that loss. Fortunately, there's that abrupt drop and then it slows down. So you have to get a, kind of get through that window of abrupt drop and then it slows down. But if you start too low, there's no way you're going to prevent getting osteoporosis. So what's the prevalence of low bone mineral density? It completely depends on the type of athlete you're studying. You know, a swimmer's already starting out kind of at a disadvantage because they're not doing weight bearing. A gymnast has a benefit because they're pounding every single joint and they're doing all sorts of different loading. So in general, it depends, again, on the study. Somewhere between 20 to 50% of female athletes have low bone density. Um, in one study of 187 elite female athletes, these were mostly runners, 10.7 had BMD Z scores less than negative 2. So that's a standard deviation, and we really want athletes to have a standard deviation of negative 1 or better. So negative 2 is really not good. Um, in professional dancers, 23% of the dancers had a Z-score of less than negative 1, but it, again, it, it varies on sport. We did a study looking at rowers versus runners and found that even in the rowers who were amenorrheic, their um, spine was a little bit better than the runners who were amenorrheic because they're doing weight-bearing with their spine and the runners are doing weight-bearing that affects their hip. Um, but also, the trabecular bone that's in the spine is usually more affected by the lack of estrogen. So when we see someone with osteoporosis who doesn't have a lot of estrogen and other hormones in their system, the spine is usually what gets it the worst. So the nice thing about rowing was even though the spine is the place that's a little more susceptible, the rowing helped counterbalance it a bit. 
This is a picture from one of the studies um, that we're doing. It's a study of uh, athletes, amenorrheic athletes, and comparing, um, giving them transdermal estrogen, meaning a patch, with oral progesterone versus giving them a pill versus giving them no treatment and seeing what can kind of affect them over the course of a year, what can help improve their bone density while we're also trying to get them to improve their nutrition. So this was just some baseline data on a, on a few of our patients. And I don't know if you can appreciate this from the slides. I look at these a lot, so it's obvious to me, but it might be hard for you to see. So basically, can you tell that this amenorrhea athlete looks less dense. There's more black in there. So her trabeculi um, are just showing that she's got less, less density. This is a more subtle finding, but in the non-athletic controls, their bones are not as wide as the eumenorrheic and amenorrheic athletes. So the other thing that we found was that with weight-bearing exercise, those bones are expanding even better. And remember what I told you about during adolescence in general, that's a time when bones are expanding. It seems that adolescent athletes have bones that expand even more. So that moment of inertia, that finer um, area that you can use to, to help with weight-bearing, the better. Imagine if you're just jumping on a little toothpick, or you're jumping on something that's this wide. This big wide thing isn't going to break as easily. But it may break pretty easy if it's really wide and there's nothing in, in between. So what are some component, components of sports performance that could be affected by menstrual cycle? All sorts of stuff. Brain function, cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, metabolic stuff, so core body temperature, our thermal regulation, acid-base balance, strength, how does it affect VO2 max, um, anaerobic capacity, what about orthopedic things, injury rate and ligamental, lack, ligamentous laxity? So we're going to go through a whole bunch of these. And again, back to my take-home point, if you need to take a snooze, the point is a lot of these studies are really bad. So what are the issues? The issues are really how do they define the population? You know, back maybe 20 years ago when they tried to study it. And, and I have to say, you know, everybody has to, has to do a study on funding. Funding is limited these days. You do the best job you can. It's very hard to do a really invasive study, get women to give hormone samples every single day for 90 days. So a lot of these studies were just surveys. Hey, when do you get your period? Do you get more injured during your period or after your period? Um, so it really de depended how they defined menstrual cycle and where people were in the cycle. Um, did they have lab values to prove anything? Was it retrospective? Hey, when you were 15, did you have your period yet? And did you ever break a bone? Is a lot different than a pro prospective study where you're studying an athlete over the course of a few years. Um, was it cross-sectional? Was it prospective? Um, in the older studies, they really just said, how did you feel around PMS in your period versus the rest of the cycle? You know, now we know we can fine-tune it. There's the earlier follicular phase, the late follicular phase, ovulation, early luteal, late luteal. You can really get as specific as you want. Um, so there are all these different phases. Some were just divided into two, some were three, some were five. The older studies again, so premenstrual and menstrual days versus the rest of the cycle. I love this quote. I know it sounds horrible that I love that, but we've all been there. Um, so the premenstrual time is a time a lot of women don't really enjoy. There's a psychological and physical discomfort. There's fluid um, retention. There are headaches, bloating, breast tenderness, bleeding. It's a good time. So obviously PMS and all those feelings of period symptoms could reduce performance. Some people just feel horrible. Um, in general, female athletes have less severe PMS symptoms than non-athletes, though. So that's a bonus. The more you exercise, the better you feel, and th the symptoms aren't as bad. In a study of 373 athletes from six different sports, over half complained of menstrual symptoms, um, yet over two-thirds said they didn't feel that these symptoms impacted their performance. And I think that's good news. I think as you become a more seasoned athlete, obviously you get used to it and you figure out, figure out how to work around your cycle. It's important to remember this. It's true. Olympic medals have been won during PMS and periods. So it can be done. So let's start with the cardiovascular system. Estrogen can enhance endothelium-dependent vasodilation, so having the vessels actually vasodilate to allow more blood flow. And this has, the, and estrogen also has a mainly positive effect on the lipid profile, so the lower LDL, the higher HDL. In older or, um, and or in unhealthy arteries with existing atherosclerotic plaques, estrogen's ability to increase inflammation could cause plaque instability in cardiovascular events. This is where we get all confused with the nurse's health study and women and hormone replacement. You know, the people that are more affected negatively by hormones are people that already have plaques and problems and are probably older. Um, they've looked at amenorrheic athletes, and they've shown to have brachial artery, so they're studying their arm. They had brachial artery endothelial dysfunction and unfavorable lipid profiles. So these are young women who are athletes, and they don't get their menstrual cycle, and they're basically testing the vasodilatory um, effects in the arm because it's harder to do a cardiac cath, nor do you get a 
15 year old that really wants a cardiac cath. So basically they're finding that those endothelial dysfunction um, studies are demonstrating it peripherally and then translating it saying, you know, so they could be having issues um, centrally as well in their heart. And certainly unfavorable lipid profiles, if they're already getting elevated LDL when they're younger because they're not getting their cycle, this is something that can have long-term problems. This puts them at a higher risk for cardio cardiovascular disease when they're older. So if I have an 18-year-old who's not getting a normal period, she probably doesn't care about her LDL, and I'm really not going to appeal to her that way, but I think it's an important thing for you all to realize to know it is more than just bones. But we need better studies on uh, the cardiovascular system in the phase of the cycle. So let's go to the respiratory system. Endogenous progesterone, so progesterone our bodies make, leads to a greater minute ventilation, so we're breathing more quickly, and maximal exercise response during the luteal phase, so that second phase after ov ovulation. And it also happens during pregnancy when we have more progesterone on board. Synthetic medroxyprogesterone acetate, so this might be the kind you would have in a birth control pill, can induce similar respiratory responses in men and in postmenopausal women. I have no idea why guys were willing to take it, but they did, and they found that they also were breathing faster and had the same kind of exercise response. Um, but estradiol increases the number and sensitivity of progesterone receptors. So it's kind of a combination of the estrogen. And I use estrogen and estradiol kind of interchangeably. It's one synthetic, one is um, in the pill, but just take them as the same. So it increases the number and sensitivity of progesterone receptors. You have some estrogen on board. Then you get somebody who's pregnant and they have more progesterone in their system, and so they're going to breathe more quickly. But it's really difficult to interpret the effects of the cycle on ventilation because it was confounded with a lot of different things. Um, we'll get to thermal regulation, and progesterone increases temperature too. So is that the reason that people are breathing harder? There's, there's a lot of different things in there. But the point is, progesterone may have an effect. This I thought was pretty interesting, asthma. Anybody here have asthma? Good for you. A few people do. Okay. So about a third of asthmatic women report an increase in symptoms during PMS. Um, but the data demonstrating changes in lung function are rare. So what that means is they feel worse, they feel like their asthma symptoms are worse, but when we actually look at um, oxygenation data, it's not actually physically different in the people that they've studied. So there's no real straightforward conclusion regarding hormones on allergic and asthmatic symptoms, but it's clear that allergic inflammation of asthma can be significantly modulated by sex hormones. So the thought is maybe does estrogen make symptoms worse and progesterone could make them better? Um, so we may be able to modulate a little bit. People who do have asthma who really notice a difference during PMS, it may be possible that we can modulate their symptoms a little bit with some progesterone. Again, we need more studies, particularly in athletes, because the few studies they've had have not been done in athletes. Um, but there may be a role for exogenous hormonal modulation. And the caveat on all these studies is women should track their own cycles and see what's happening for them. Because I'm not going to throw every person who's ever had asthma on some sort of progesterone to help them. If you have no symptoms and you never notice the difference, it's probably not having such an effect on you. So now to the thermoregulation. Progesterone and the synthetic progestins have a central thermogenic effect. So that means basically they're increasing the basal body temperature about 0.3 to 0.5 degrees Celsius during pregnancy when we have a lot of progesterone on board and also again the luteal phase when that progesterone is the predominant hormone. Um, there's altered skin blood flow and an increased threshold for cutaneous vasodilation. So the temperature has to get higher for there to be vasodilation to lose heat and a higher temperature for the onset of sweating. So in general, some women feel hotter during the luteal phase. They do have a core body temperature that's higher, hotter and pregnant women feel hotter. So a higher core body temperature may reduce the safe margin for heat accumulation. Now everybody's different. Some women may be able to run in 100 degrees and they're fine. But it's important to realize that during the luteal phase, if you're someone who gets these symptoms, you're not crazy. It may be because you have more progesterone on board, it's hot out, and it's just enough to tip you over that you're feeling like you're more fatigued and your, your performance is, is compromised a little bit. You guys following all this so far? It's a lot of information. Substrate metabolism. So estrogen promotes glycogen uptake. We want glycogen. Glycogen is what we use um, to get our muscles moving. It's an energy source. So basically, we want glycogen uptake, and then we store it in the liver, and then later it's broken down and we use it for energy. So estrogen promotes glycogen uptake and storage in the liver and the muscle through increased lipid synthesis and then breakdown in muscle. So higher levels of estrogen, and a little bit to a lesser extent progesterone, tend to spare glycogen stores by shifting metabolism more toward free fatty acids. So basically you have two major types of fuel that you can use when you're exercising. Glycogen, which is usually a little bit more efficient, and free fatty acids. What um, estrogen tends to do is it causes the body to store up that glycogen, keep it in the muscles, and then rely more on the fatty free acids. 
So this may contribute to a woman's enhanced capability for ultra-endurance exercise compared with men. So basically, they have this gly glycogen storage, but they're also burning fat while they're doing their ultra-marathon, and so they're able to, to use more of the fuel that they have on board. You agreeing with me that back there, nutritionist? Awesome. Um, estrogen also likely improves carb tolerance. So what does that mean? So you're talking about the person who's somewhat... Um, not a full diabetic, but they may be glucose intolerant. You've heard of those type of people. So this is what this is talking about. Estrogen could improve carb tolerance through actions of lipolytic enzymes and glucoregulatory hormones such as growth hormone, catecholamines, insulin. Um, but it's an opposite effect to what progesterone does. So there's a deterioration of carb metabolism and relative glucose intolerance during the luteal phase. So if estrogen may be good for carb tolerance and getting insulin to be produced appropriately for the amount of glucose that's in your blood, progesterone has the opposite effect. That's why, or part of why, there is an increased problem with insulin resistance in pregnancy. So again, what do we say about pregnancy? There's an increase in progesterone, and progesterone may screw up our insulin-carb relationship. So there's this insulin insensitivity or insulin resistance that happens for a lot of women. You've heard of gestational diabetes, women who may even just have this, trans this transient problem with glucose while they're pregnant, and then after they're not pregnant, they get over it. So that may be part of the reason is that high level of progesterone. Um, but the good news is there may be differences, but there's a great way to counteract that. So this study basically showed the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So again, if we're talking about the luteal phase having higher progesterone, this is a study where they looked at performance time. So they were doing a running race, and basically they were seeing um, how long it took to finish. And during the luteal phase, it was worse. But what they did is they had these people not eat anything the night before and not have any carbs in the morning and then just go do this trial. When they actually gave them some carbs, notice then there's no difference between follicular and luteal. So the take-home message is we may be a little different from one half of the cycle to the next, but if we fuel appropriately, it may not matter. If you're going to starve yourself, it may matter. So what about psychology? Basically, it's hard to say yet. The studies have mostly been based on the calendar timing of the cycle. So again, surveys, when was your period, where are you now in your cycle, not actually checking the different hormones in someone's urine or in their blood. And they thought maybe estrogen does mediate different aspects of cognition, alertness, cognitive performance. Both estrogen and testosterone have been related to spatial cognition, but they seem to have opposite effects. Progesterone may make you tired. Um, high levels of estradiol during the luteal phase are postulated to cause poor performance on tasks of spatial ability. But again, these studies aren't very good, which is why I'm being really vague. The cool thing is now we have something called functional MRI. Have you ever seen these kind of images where you can see the brain light up? That's what they're starting to do more, and I think we're going to get some cool data by looking at women during their phase and then do different kind of cognitive testing while they're on different hormonal treatments or they're in different phases of their cycle. So what about strength training? There have been very few well-designed studies on menstrual cycle and strength, and basically the good ones really tested neuromuscular contraction. They just didn't tell a girl to bench max. They basically had all sorts of things hooked up to them so they could see what muscles are firing, how much resistance is happening when the muscles are being activated, and those have shown no variability across the menstrual cycle. So those are the only studies I'm mentioning. Is basically the ones that did it really well and tested appropriately didn't find a difference. Estradiol, though, in addition to exercise itself, is known to modify growth hormone. So you know people dope and use growth hormone. Why do they use growth hormone? To build muscle, right, and to get strong. So we know that estradiol modifies growth hormone secretion and metabolism. So should we plan lifting schedules around our periods when we know our estrogen level is higher? I don't know. It sounds like a cool idea, but we don't really know yet. So we'll see. Hopefully time will tell. Aerobic capacity, so maximal oxygen capacity and submaximal exercise responses don't seem to clinically significantly differ across the cycle. And I say clinically because some of these studies are like 0.01, and that wouldn't make any difference when you actually try to translate that into any kind of performance. It's not even like 0.01 of a second. It's just showing a number that's statistically different but didn't actually translate into anything that meant anything to me in terms of a running distance or a strength or aerobic capacity. So it may be relevant for a very elite endurance athlete if you're talking about a really small fraction of a difference with maximal oxy oxygen capacity. Um, LeBron et al., so this is somebody um, who I know fairly well from the Female Athlete Tribe Coalition, she did a study a while ago, basically back in 95, that showed a slight decrease in both the abs absolute and relative VO2 max um, that happens during that follicular, or during that luteal phase. But I'm showing you the same graph as before, remember? Because what's my take-home point? Eat. Right, eat. 
If you eat some carbs, it really doesn't matter. So aerobic endurance, so uh, capacity is like how, what, what is your VO2? Endurance is how long can you go for? So these are the girls that are doing the ultra distance. These are the people who are doing the marathon. The studies have been contradict contradictory. So it's um, an improvement's been reported during the luteal phase. So here I've been telling you all these things are bad about the luteal phase. Oops, something else is good about the luteal phase. You can last longer. So you may be breathing heavier, your temperature may be higher, um, your VO2 might be slightly lower, but looks, you, you can go longer. That's why it's really hard to just say, yeah, Go exercise during this phase. So they found an improvement during the luteal phase, but was associated with an increased muscle glycogen or diminished blood lactate, so that's that sparing effect. But then other more recent studies really didn't even see a difference. The subtle effect of endogenous ovarian hormones, the ones that we have on glucose kinetics, likely are much less important than getting our carbs. What about anaerobic capacity? Um, Either no difference in anaerobic power output between the cycle phases, or there's an increased anaerobic capacity and peak power during the luteal phase. Those are what all these different studies taught me, is there might be a difference, um, or there's not. And it might be better during the luteal phase, or there may be not. Are you seeing why this gets confusing? I wanted to give you a, just a bullet at the end to be like, exercise and do your Olympic trials during day 27 of your cycle, but I can't tell you that. So what about the phase of the cycle and injury? We've talked about this a little bit with the ACL. And this is the graph that Bridget, Bridget and I share way too many slides. Um, you can tell we trained uh, uh, together. But basically, this is that great slide that tells us, all right, on the outside, this is when people had higher rates of laxity in all these different studies. Every name is a study of somebody, and they looked at laxity, and they found it, OK, but this is just before ovulation, and this is through the luteal phase. Laxity gets worse. Oh, that must be where ACL injuries happen. Well, then no, the inside one shows when ACL injuries happen. That's not relating to the laxity. Well, they kind of overlap here. Is it happening right around ovulation? Um, we don't know. Female to male ratio we know is higher in ACL, or the, the ACL injury is higher in the females than, than the males. Uh, we know that there's sex hormone receptors on the ACL, so that's pretty cool. We know that there's an estrogen receptor there and a testosterone receptor there. But we don't really know. Is that pre-ovulatory phase worse? Guess what? We need better data. That's what Greg Meyer is going to help us with going to get us that data. So what about the phase of the cycle and ankle injuries? This is a pretty good study that they did looking at ankle instability. So basically they're testing about women and their laxity when they invert their ankle, like we've probably all done and probably done in heels. So they tested 20 men and 20 women, and the mean age was around 24. And basically they did a pretty good job with the ovulation. They tried to use ovulation kits uh, for three months to determine the time of ovulation. And then the women were tested in the lab. I didn't even talk about the men. But the women were tested in the lab during their pre-ovulatory and their post-ovulatory phases. And they did this ankle arthrometer where they're measuring the laxity in the ankle. And they did this, this uh, star excursion balance test where they wanted to see what their stability was like on their ankle. And they found that women presented with more ankle inversion, eversion, laxity, and less dynamic postural control versus men. But the hormonal fluctuations during the cycle didn't really correlate. So they were more lax, and they did have less dynamic postural control. Is it because their training wasn't as good? Is it because um, you know, no one had paid attention to their ankles? Is it because of the hyperlaxity? We don't know, but the point was it didn't really matter during their cycle. What about concussion? We'll have a whole talk. Um, or actually, did any of you go to the concussion talk? That was the last session. So the concussion in women, it's, it's interesting. We know that concussion... Um, Women have a higher risk of concussion when they're in comparable sports, so that's the caveat. You know, we talk about men and football, and that's what's getting all the attention. There's no question that men are getting concussions and they're playing a ton of football. But if you take women and compare them in a comparable sport, so women soccer players versus male soccer players, women have a higher risk of concussion. And their symptoms tend to be longer. They tend to suffer from headaches more. So there are differences. Um, they looked at 36 female college athletes, 12 were eumenorrheic athletes, 24 were on the pill. They did the impact testing. Do you guys know what impact testing is? It's basically that neurocognitive testing that you do. Um, and they are also given a symptom scale. And they um, also gave them postural stability testing. So they found in this study that there were no significant differences in the neuropsych testing as part of the impact test between the groups or in the earlier late phases of the cycle. And they found that eumenorrheic athletes had slightly more symptoms and worse severity compared to those on OCPs. But again, it's a small study, so we don't really know what to do with that. Does that mean? Eumenorrheic women should all get on the pill? I don't think so. So that's just what we know so far. So let's talk about the pill. We 
already mentioned that people used to just throw girls on the pill all the time, whether they needed it for birth control, they thought it was good to regulate their cycle. It's not necessarily a bad thing, so we'll talk about when it's good or not good to be on a pill. It is the main form of birth control in the general population, and with the newer low-dose pills, their use has really increased, even in, especially in athletic women. So they reduce the cycle length variability. It's nice to be able to predict when someone's getting their cycle. Um, so they really provide a more consistent 28-day cycle. It controls the endogenous sex hormones because it basically shuts most of the system down. Your body doesn't need to do this constant feedback if you're getting a daily pill with a certain amount of estrogen and progesterone in it. So it really reduces the natural production of estrogens and progesterones, and I should add on there a whole lot of other hormones as well. So what are the benefits? It's a reliable form of contraception. It's great when your adolescent athlete doesn't get pregnant, so that's a bonus. Um, it makes menses predictable, so you can tweak the timing of menses. Let's say somebody does just have horrible PMS symptoms and they really don't perform well when they're cramping. They can actually get on the pill and start timing it and, and getting it over the course of a few months so that they know they can keep from having their PMS or their menstrual phase, um, keep from having it during their major competition. It can reduce PMS, it can reduce dysmenorrhea, which means painful periods, it can reduce menorrhagia, which are heavier prolonged periods, and it can reduce dysfunctional uterine bleeding, this abnormal cycle length. It may decre decrease the risk of iron deficiency, so if a woman has a very, very heavy menstrual cycle, it may help with that part. Um, so it can reduce also the functional ovarian cysts, benign breast lesions, risk of endometrial and ovarian cancers. It sounds awesome. No wonder everyone wanted to be on the pill. So, what do people feel about it? Well, they did a cross-national online survey of women who were 15 to 49, this is a nice big study, who are currently using, had used, or would consider using a hormonal contraceptive. And this study was conducted in eight countries across Europe, North America, Latin America, and nearly a third reported that bleeding had a severe negative impact on their daily life, particularly with respect to sexual life and sports activities. About 60% wanted to postpone their bleeding. Why would you want you to get your period? Of course they wanted to postpone it. 50% wished that they had flexibility to determine when their cycle would start. And 34% of the women would change the frequency of their bleeding to once every two to three months. So th these are legitimate feelings, legitimate concerns. I can't blame anybody about those answers. So what's in a pill? What are we giving them? The pill basically has estrogen and progesterone. Have you guys heard of the mini pill? This is the pill that we, put, uh, we give to women who need contraception but maybe breastfeeding, they just get the progesterone only. In general, we don't like to do the mini pill for a long period of time because they're just getting progesterone. And if you take progesterone for a really long time, when they used to give people Depo-Provera, that can actually decrease bone density. But you know, if someone needs it for a few months while they're breastfeeding, fine, we'll give them a mini pill. The only synthetic estrogen in today's pill, and I put in the U.S., is ethanyl estradiol. And the reason I put in the U.S. is because last week I was sitting next to Connie Lebrun, that woman who did the other study, and she said, you know, there's another one in Canada. But if you're all from the U.S., this is the only estrogen you have a choice to use. It's ethanyl estradiol, and that's what's in every one of our pills. It does cause nausea and breast tenderness, but it also supports the endometrium, and it causes less breakthrough bleeding. But there are lots of different progesterones, and this is where pills get really complicated. So there's six major progestogens. Um, progesterone is a type of progestogen, and some are more androgenic than others, so meaning they have more um, testosterone-like um, effects. So those are the two that are most. Levonorgestrel and norethesterone, those are the two that are the more androgenic. So if you have someone who breaks out really easily and she wants to be on a pill, don't give her one with one of those two in it. It's going to make symptoms worse because it's more androgenic. Um, progesterones, like I said, just like through the regular cycle, progesterones maintain the endometrial lining. Some are more potent, some are more androgenic, and so there's a little equation you can figure out how androgenic a pill is or how potent a pill is. And if you're going to your OB and you say, I want to get in a pill and you want to bring these things up, she should be able to calculate out which ones do what. Um, in general, progestogens act as an antagonist at the aldosterone receptor on the kidneys. So basically they block that receptor. And so during the luteal phase, you have all this progesterone, and at that point, there's more water loss because aldosterone helps you hold on to electrolytes and hold on to water. So during the luteal phase, progesterone's really high, and it causes more water and electrolyte loss. But this then causes your body to hyperstimulate aldosterone. It says, well, aldosterone's not working. We need more aldosterone. So then progesterone crashes right before you're going to get your period. So what happens then? People get bloated. That's because they have huge amounts of aldosterone now. Our body's really mean. It just has this little vicious cycle thing happening. So that's what happens. This rapid drop of progesterone happens as you switch from the luteal phase to that early follicular phase, and then aldosterone's really high, and that's why we get that bloating. So now you know. 
So what are the different types of OCPs? There's monophasic, that's like the top graph. It's a consistent amount of progesterone, a consistent amount of estrogen. And then there's the biphasic, where you may have a stable estrogen, but maybe two types, two doses of, um, of progesterone. And then there's triphasic. That gets a little trickier. There's three different levels of progesterone, probably one to two different levels of estrogen, but every chunk of the cycle is a different amount. And here are just a few examples of what we have to choose from. So someone says, what's your favorite pill? I don't know. Depends what your problem is. So that's just an example of all our monophasic choices. Here's an example of some of our bi and triphasic choices. So then you can imagine when someone asks me, how does the pill affect my performance, what am I going to ask? <laughs> what pill are you on? And then I'm going to say to myself, what study has been big enough to study the exact pill that this woman is asking about? What do you think my answer is going to be? I have no idea. So this part will be really fast. Um, OCPs and body composition, they're very small studies. So the monophasic study showed that athletic women could have an increase in body mass, while inactive women could gain or lose weight. Um, the triphasic may increase body mass and fat mass. So these are the really small studies. Those were their conclusions. There are theoretical issues in weight class sports, aesthetic sports, and even speed sports. So if you have somebody on a very high dose pill, um, and they are in a sport where they have to weigh in, aka lightweight rowing, they may have an issue if they're one of these athletes who got an increase in body weight on that monophasic pill. But this is, again, where you have to be on something for a while, see how your body adjusts, give it that full three-month trial, and see what happens. What about body temperature? Just like the high, higher body temperature during the luteal phase when we have higher progesterone, there can be a higher body temperature with exogenous progesterone. The monophasic OCPs seem to shift the baseline core body temp and that vas vasodilatory threshold. So those studies look pretty good. If someone is on a heavy dose monophasic pill, it seems that their temperature may be slightly higher. There's only really one small study, so it's not worth mentioning because it only had five subjects. That was a study on triphasic, so I'm not even going to tell you what the results were. Um, OCPs and the metabolism. So OCPs with those two types of hormone norgestimate and desogestrel, this is why you have handouts because you'll never remember this, I can't, um, and also have estrogen in them, may ensure a more stable response to carbs across the menstrual cycle. If you don't have a problem with carbs, you don't need to If you're somebody who's kind of teetering on glucose intolerance with some insulin insensitivity, maybe that matters. OCPs with norlestrin and some quantity of norgestimate may have some muscle glycogen sparing effects. So this could be a potential for long duration sporting events, like we were talking about women who do really well in long distance events. Maybe if you had a pill that um, enhanced that muscle glycogen sparing effect, it could be helpful. What about aerobic capacity? So far, there haven't been any obvious differences with the monophasic pill. When they looked at triphasic pills, they showed a decrease in VO2 peak in highly trained athletes. So again, we're back to the, does something going on um, in the luteal phase, and does triphasic kind of replicate that luteal phase a little bit? It could be a blunting of the sympathetic nervous system because of high hormonal concentrations in these pills, but it also could just be, um, it, or it could be like what we see with the uh, high hormonal state during pregnancy. So back to that whole idea with progesterone. What about cardiovascular response? Could estrogen and progesterone induce um, increases in plasma volume? So we know that estrogen and progesterone increase our plasma volume. Could that increase the preload and cardiac output? We would think that would be good because you have more volume to pump through your heart and pump through your body. However, the newer monophasic formulations didn't show a significant performance effect. Um, and in the triphasic pills that have been studied, there's no difference in max heart rate or blood pressure. So this study, um, looking at monophasic pills, looked at just six competitive swimmers and water polo players, so not very many people. But they did a 200-meter um, swimming time trial, and basically they looked at them between days 17 and 21. That was the consumption phase when they were on the pill. And then two to three days post-active pill, so that's withdrawal, early on withdrawal. And then six to seven days post-active, so that's later withdrawal. And they didn't find any difference in the time, how many strokes they put, took per minute, what their peak heart rate was or peak blood glucose. Um, peak blood lactate was lower during the withdrawal, withdrawal 2 versus consumption. Peak pH was higher, so they noticed some differences, but in terms of performance, they didn't find a difference. In the triphasic pill um, study, they did one very small study with rowers. They found an increased peak power over 1,000 meters um, on days 26 to 28 when estrogen and progesterone were the lowest, but other studies didn't really corroborate that. What about muscle strength? No difference has been noted in the pill studies. Um, the workout recovery, there's really been sparse or inconclusive data. So 
My point about the pill is I think this is a great thing to study and we need more data. I think this could be very helpful if we knew that there were an ideal pill to put somebody on because somebody has horrible PMS or someone has horrible dysfunctional uterine bleeding or somebody says that they feel much worse during their menstrual phase or they find that their asthma symptoms are bad. But we really need better OCP studies. So we need to know the training status of the subjects. I don't want to extrapolate data from a couch potato to an elite athlete because we know that their bodies are different. Um, the number of subjects, I want a study that has more than five people because I'm going to be more confident in telling you about those results. What OCP are we studying? Are we looking at a monophasic? Are we looking at a high dose pill? Um, and what about the number of OCP cycles to test? The thing that really screws up all these little studies that say, oh, this girl got her, um, did an ovulation kit, or this person had labs done, versus a study where they just quiz the girl, when was your last period? We don't know if those people are all ovulating. We don't know if their hormonal levels are actually what's typical, because you know that a lot of athletes have menstrual irregularities. They may even get their period, but we can't really extrapolate and say that was a normal cycle. Which days to test throughout the cycle? Are we going to check just the early follicular, just the late luteal, just ovulation? Are we checking the hormone levels? You get my point. The point is we need better data. And then what about the, the cycle in general? So you're going to hear all about the female athlete tribe tomorrow. I won't beat it to death, even though it's my favorite topic. But we have to really think of the menstrual cycle as another vital sign. People don't like to get their periods, but we know that the menstrual cycle is important for a lot of health reasons. So inevitably... Translate that to it's important for performance. Um, if you have decreased energy availability and the menstrual irregularity, there's going to be poor bone health, but also poor performance. But we have to also make sure that there aren't other pathologies, and we have to rule those out. So PCOS, prolactinoma, hyper and hypothyroidism, like I mentioned before. So if someone doesn't get their cycle, that means it needs to be looked into. There may be performance issues in hot climates for some athletes during the luteal phase. So that's one thing we can say is definitely the case. Some people may have a problem with that higher level of progesterone during the luteal phase when they're exercising in a hot climate. It may push them over the edge. But record-setting performances have occurred at all phases of the cycle. And guess what? We need way more data. Um, what about the pill? So in the triad patients, it's better to treat the disorder than to just throw them on the pill. Again, we're going to talk about this more tomorrow. We're currently doing studies to say, okay, that's great if you want someone to get her period, but what if it's going to take her a year and a half to get over her eating disorder? Or what if it's going to take her a while to convince her that she needs to get a little bit more energy intake? Is there something else we should be doing? Should we put them on the pill? Should we put them on transdermal estrogen? Should we be giving them IGF-1 injections? We're trying to figure that out, but no question every one of those people needs to be talked and talked to and counseled about increasing their caloric intake to try to get their cycle back on their own. Um, it may be fine to use the pill to help manipulate the timing of the cycle for some people. You know, I often feel very comfortable getting a bone density on somebody who wants to be on the pill for a long period of time. You can come up with pretty much any reason to get a bone density. They cost less than $100. They're usually covered by insurance. Someone has an amazing bone density and they hate getting their period and they want to manipulate their cycle so they're not having PMS when they're performing we can probably put them on the pill and feel pretty good about it. It might help with hyperandrogenism in some athletes. We've all heard of women going on the pill and saying, it cleared up my skin, I went on orthotricycline, and my skin got better. I only mention that one particularly because that one got FDA approved for treating um, symptoms of PCOS and hyperandrogenism. But a lot of the pills work that way. But we don't really know the long-term effects. You know, the bone density may be fine to begin with, but do I feel comfortable saying to someone, yeah, you can be on the pill for the next two decades and you, you'll be good. We're the generation that's catching up with that. We don't know what's happening to us. We'll see. What happened with my friends and colleagues who were on the pill for 20 years? Are their bones a little bit worse than those who weren't? It's hard to study that because there's all sorts of things that confound that. I was on a pill. I got off. I lost my period for a while when I was in the national team running. I had four babies. You know, all those things make those studies really murky. So we're going to have to get a huge end to follow that over two decades. So really, when I have an athlete who's wondering about the pill or wondering about their cycle, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. You want people to really track their own cycles, track their own performance, and see if they can find patterns. And guess what? We need more research. So thank you. I know that was long and complicated. This is my daughter trying to become an athlete. And um, 